Yeah, so a, a common uh, reason for epilepsy is lack of inhibition. If there is, there is not enough inhibition, then uh, there is some hyperactivity in some area of the brain and then it can be sufficient to trigger seizures. And that's why we started. We wanted to understand why there is such a lack of inhibition. Hello, homo sapiens. Now, welcome back to Epilepsy Sparks Insights. Now, are you new to the epilepsies or epileptology in general? Because if you are, and actually maybe if you aren't as well, you might want to have a pen and paper ready for this episode. Because today we have the scientist Jean-Francois Perrier from the University of Copenhagen with us, who will be explaining his exciting discoveries about the STX-BP1 epilepsy and how, get this, it appears that we need to use molecules to enhance the activity of excitatory synapses rather than chill them out. As always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe because your comment and your like will help spread awareness and understanding of the epilepsies around the world. And now on to our star of the week, Jean-Francois Perrier. Based in Denmark, but I was uh, born in France. I am French and Danish now. Uh, I moved to Denmark about uh, 28 years ago, uh, first as a postdoc student, and then I, after some years, I became associate professor at the University of Copenhagen in the Department of Neuroscience, where I'm still working. So your research um, is largely to do with um, genetic epilepsy. Yes, actually, uh, I am new in the field. Uh, I've been working on fundamental research uh, to try to understand how the brain is working for many, many years, and then about... Uh, Four years ago, I was contacted by a colleague who is very interested in one particular form of epilepsy. Uh, and he asked me if I could join uh, because uh, we work on slice preparation with a tool called electrophysiology, which means that we can record the activity of uh, individual neurons. And then he believed that we could bring some novelty in the field by uh, studying a, a model of the disease. Actually, That's what we did four years ago. and. For me, it was completely new when at the first meeting, I understood nothing they were saying. But then uh, after uh, some years working very hard with my postdoc and uh, PhD students, we finally understood some important things. So the specific um, genetic epilepsy that you're working on, what's that called, please? So it's called STXBP1. So STXBP1 is the name of the gene that is mutated in the patient that suffer from this uh, form of epilepsy, actually. And it's a very important gene for uh, communication between neurons. So probably you know that neurons communicate with each other by means of synapses. So uh, when a synapse is active, it can release a small molecule that we call the neurotransmitter that uh, communicate between the first neuron and the second neuron. And it tells the neuron either to be more active or less active, depending on the synapse that is excitatory or inhibitory. So the gene we are working on is important for all synapses. If it was not there, then the if we, it was not expressed, then synapses synaptic transmission would not work actually. Huh. So in, in the patient, there is what we call hyperinsufficiency. So it means that the gene is expressed, but not enough to to secure a good communication. So the communication between neurons is altered, is impaired actually. And I believe it can be an issue if the activity is overactive, which I think is more commonly understood by lay people, but also it can be an issue if it's underactive as well. Yeah, so a, a common uh, reason for epilepsy is lack of inhibition. If there is, there is not enough inhibition, then uh, there is some hyperactivity in some area of the brain, and then it can be sufficient to trigger seizures, actually. So that's a common rule for that. Um, so and if the challenge for us was to understand how a gene that is important for both excitatory and inhibitory synaptic transmission can lead to epilepsy because if you impair both, you would predict that the, the net activity of the brain should simply be decreased everywhere. But it's not the case because we know that all the patients suffer from epilepsy actually. So there is a, somehow a lack of inhibition, but we couldn't understand why. And that's where we started. We wanted to understand why there is such a lack of inhibition, actually. Yeah, which is, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because uh, in lots of rare epilepsy, for genetic um, epilepsies, not everybody will experience the seizures, right? So we'll commonly say it's a rare epilepsy, but actually lots of people with whatever mutation it is don't experience seizures. But you say with, with this mutation, every single person experiences. When I say everyone, it's uh, about 90% of patients who suffer from very severe seizures uh, 
and most every day actually. And do they experience symptoms other than seizures too? Things like intellectual disability, autism, etc.? They, they have very severe symptoms. Epilepsy is one of them, it's the most common one, but they also suffer from intellectual disability, motor impairment, global delays, uh, and autism in about 20% of the cases actually. So it's, it's a very, very severe uh, disease actually. And, and the problem is that now there is a, no good treatment. Clinician try to reduce symptom by trying different uh, drugs that are available on the market, but, but there is no very good rationale for treating patients. So the, the things are tried and sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. So I think uh, any improvement, any uh, understanding could maybe help some patients actually, and that's what we are working on now. So you've gone from in vitro to in vivo, um, and that your principle does actually reduce seizures generally in these patients, is that correct? During three years, uh, we have been working very hard on an in vitro preparation. So it means that it's, we have an, an animal model uh, that suffer from the same mutation uh, found in patients. And what we do is that we make a slice preparation from the brain of these mice, and then we can record the activity of uh, individual neurons and then study synapses uh, isolated synapses actually one by one. And what we have been working on is uh, uh, the, the, the cortex where epilepsy is occurring in these patients. And we, we have been uh, studying a microcircuit of the brain called feed forward inhibition. And it's, it sounds complicated, but it's important if you want to understand uh, what is going on actually. So in, in these microcircuits, Neurons receive excitatory inputs, so with excitatory synapse, but in parallel, they also receive inhibitory input because the excitatory input activates inhibitory interneuron that in turn inhibit the, the, the principal neurons. So in this way, with this microcircuit, there is an automatic balance between excitation and inhibition because every time the neuron is, is excited, it's inhibited at the same time, actually. And it's known that uh, this microcircuit is essential for normal brain function. So we have been studying that in our uh, mouse model of the disease. And what we found, and it was really unexpected, is that excitatory synapses were much more affected than inhibitory synapses. Inhibitory synapses were working normally. And this was very surprising because I just told you that there is a lack of inhibition in patients. So, in fact, what is happening is that the excitatory synapses are not able to activate the inhibitory interneuron. And for this reason, they remain silent, even though they, they could work properly. Uh, and so we, we have a lack of excitation that paradox paradoxically favors excitation. There is not enough inhibition because excitation is not working enough. And we think it's very important because uh, it opens for a new principle for treating patients. We think that instead of treating inhibitory synapses, uh, which is a common way to treat epilepsy, uh, there are many drugs that target inhibitory synapses. We think instead for this particular disease, we should target excitatory synapses. And it may sound weird, but we think that we should enhance the activity of excitatory synapses. And we have a potential molecule that can do that because there is a family of molecules that are called positive allosteric modulator mm -hmm. that uh, increase the activity of uh, excitatory synapses. So the good thing is that they do not activate these synapses uh, on themselves because this would be very dangerous, it could trigger epilepsy, but they just bind to inside the synapse and if the synapse become active because the brain wants to activate them, then the, uh, the response is slightly en enhanced actually. We have tested our ID on our, on our own slice preparation and we got interesting results uh, that we, we published in a paper. Uh, so it's very promising. And of course, the next step is to go to uh, in vivo because there is a huge gap between in vitro preparation to uh, all animal. And, and for this, we have established a model where we can record the epileptic activity that is occurring spontaneously in these animals. I mean, uh, several times per hour. And then we can test the effect of uh, the molecule I told you about, this positive allosteric modulator for uh, AMPA receptors. And our preliminary results, which we have not published yet, are very encouraging. I mean, uh, we have tried uh, different molecules and all of them induce a very strong, dramatic decrease in the frequency of, uh, of uh, epileptic seizures in animals. So 
So we are very excited and we think that uh, this result could be very interesting and important for patients. Well, yes, important for patients, obviously, number one, but secondarily for whole families. Yes. Epilepsy in general affects the whole family, but but the rare genetic, very, very severe epilepsies affect families even even more. So I imagine, should this be effective, fingers crossed, this will impact positively impact the lives of whole families. This is our hope. Of course, I don't want to promise anything. I mean, uh, you know, there is always a gap between animal model and, and patients. But at least we right now, we have all the reason to believe that this, this should be tested. And for this reason, we, we are in contact with a different clinician, both from the Philadelphia Hospital in Denmark and also with a clinician from uh, Amsterdam uh, University Hospital. And uh, they, are, they express their interest in our findings and we hope that we, we will be able to start clinical trial in collaboration with them uh, uh, early this year or next year, actually. That's very exciting. And I often mention this in the podcast, but uh, when we have to sometimes think about money, right? And it is funding that enables research to occur and trials to occur. Um, so I understand that you're just kind of at that in, in that area at the moment, just waiting to see if grants come through and so that hopefully this can go ahead. That's uh, perfectly correct. I mean, if we want to go to clinical trial level, we need money because it's very expensive. And luckily uh, in Denmark, there are very uh, generous foundations, private foundation uh, that uh, have grants that we can apply to. And we, we just applied to two of the main foundation and we hope that uh, they will share our enthusiasm and then uh, fund our research. But we don't know yet, but we, we will. If they don't do it, then we will just apply again and again because we, we all believe, I mean, when I say we, it's uh, my lab and the clinician, we all believe that it's a very interesting idea with a, a huge potential. So we, we will uh, keep applying until we get funded, actually. This is brilliant stuff. And for those who maybe think, uh, oh, well, these rare epilepsies, they don't necessarily affect anybody I know or any of my patients. I think it's worth noting that, well, that one of them at least will at some point. And in addition, I'm, I'm not sure if you would agree with this, but the research that you're carrying out and the, and the trials that will come about um, actually will long-term benefit people who are affected by different types of epilepsies as well. This is our hope, actually. Uh, so... We, we are already uh, thinking about, about that, actually. So the disease we work on is called SCXBP1 encephalopathy. And what we found is that it affects the activity of a particular type of interneuron in the cortex called the basket cells. But uh, in fact, there are other types of epilepsy which also affect this neuron. For example, absence epilepsy or another form of epilepsy called the Dravet syndrome uh, is, is also affecting the firing of these cells. So, uh, we want to, to test when we have time uh, if uh, our principal can also benefit from for, for this type of epilepsy. A huge thanks to Jean-Francois for sharing such surprising and exciting research results with us regarding his research into the rare genetic epilepsy SCXBP1. You can find links to Jean-Francois and his work via the website. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and see you next time.